Okay, good morning. Hi. Good to be back. I feel better. I'm not 100% yet. It wasn't COVID. I was tested on Wednesday. The test was negative. And whatever virus it was, it's going away. I feel a little better every day, although my mind is still like a bucket with a hole. I cannot hold on to the same thought for more than a minute. Today, we're going to complete our view and analysis of the talented Mr. Ripley from 1999, directed by Anthony Minghella. I will introduce the general themes and our focus is to establish to what extent the main character of Tom Ripley in this film, one of many that were based on Patricia Highsmith, Highsmith's uh, character, is Machiavellian. After we uh, see the, the last few scenes in this film, we will entertain a discussion on the film itself. If there is time, I will go back to the introduction of the ideas and the template for the final paper. Otherwise, I'll leave enough time next Wednesday for that. I haven't had time, I wasn't able to update the website, but I will do uh, this afternoon, I will do that and add at least one reading about the film as usual, one reading from the textbook called Machiavelliana and update the readings on the prints. I hope you were able to take advantage of the videos that I posted from 2020. I hope the instructions were clear and you didn't have any issues accessing those videos. Otherwise, let me know if you haven't done so, please watch those videos. They're not full videos, they're segments of two different, from two different videos, I believe. Keep in mind that the first time we watched scenes from Mr. Ripley, I asked the students to take notes and during the class or later post them inside the Google Docs file that you are using for the assignments. If you weren't in class during this first activity on Mr. Ripley, please do so today. If you've never posted any notes about the film, do so, as I said. You can take the notes on a piece of paper and then post them uh, on your Google Docs file later on so that next week I'll be able to review them. If you already did the activity, then it's up to you. You can expand those notes, post a second series of notes, or just abstain today and participate in the discussion that follows. If you weren't here the first time, I will introduce and recap the plot of the film before we watch uh, today's segments from Amazon Prime. In the meanwhile, let me explain what I wrote. So our, the, the focus of our pursuit is to respond to the question, is Tom Ripley a Machiavellian character and in what sense? And I drew a line, and of course, on the left of this line, I placed some elements that I would expect to find in a Machiavellian character that is consistent with the ideas that we extracted from the prince. So, for example, I would imagine the character to have some leadership. And the kind of leadership that is appreciated by Machiavelli, being a man of his time, is ambition. Do we find much ambition in Tom Ripley? Not according to this film. In the book, uh, Tom Ripley is already an established hustler, much more than he is in the film and in the interpretation of Matt Damon of this character we find certainly desire, and the form that this desire takes is often impulse. 
uh, Tom Ripley is represented as an impulsive character in this film. Not someone who couples his desires to be famous, to be rich, to be loved with careful planning, especially medium and long-term planning. And the other incarnation of Tom Ripley, Tom Ripley's desire is envy. Clearly he's envious and jealous of what people such as Dickie Greenleaf have, apparently without any merit. Although we must say that Dick Greenleaf is much more in control of his life than Tom, that Tom Ripley is, right? More of a man, you might say, I'm thinking about what uh, Don Vito Corleone would have said to Tom Ripley, right? And what he says, for example, to the character of John Fontaine, okay? Uh, so, leadership is coupled with ambition, and ambition in a proper leader, according to Machiavelli, is combined with planning. It is essential. We don't find much of that. Of course, we would expect careful consideration of the context in which Machiavellian games are played and the nature of the context. And oftentimes we see that a context is combined with a larger context. So you have the context of a criminal behavior, for example, in the case of Tom Ripley, he kills Dickie Greenleaf. Later on, he will kill Freddie Miles, the friend of Dickie. But what is the larger context? The larger context for a con artist of sorts, such as, or, or if you want to call it by his name, I would say a sociopath, such as Tom Ripley is society itself. Now, in the case of a Machiavellian leader, this Machiavellian leader is a political leader, and therefore, not only he can gain and maintain control within the context of a political or military operation, but as far as the larger context, being a political leader, he is supposed to be someone who controls the game. That is to say, there is no higher authority, at least within this leader's society, than his own authority. So it's mostly a game of interaction and competition for influence between the leader and the subjects, the leader and possible opponents, competitors who might overthrow his power. In the case of Tom Ripley, it doesn't matter how much control he gains and maintains within the, co within the context of one of his scams or crimes. So for example, he goes out to sea on a little boat with Dick Greenleaf and he will kill Green Greenleaf, right? Tom will kill him, will gain control and get all of the control because, co because uh, the, the competitor is killed. There is no one around, no eyewitnesses, right? But within the larger context of society, does that gain much control for Ripley? No, actually, he, the, the, the crimes expose him to the dangers of being interrogated by the police, as he will be discovered by the friends of Greenleaf, as he will be, and therefore, within the larger context of society, in this case, for the case of this story, the Italian society, in which uh, uh, Greenleaf has transferred himself and uh, Tom Ripley joins him there in the context of Italian society. Greenleaf, uh, uh, Ripley doesn't gain much control other than the money that he can take out of the bank pretending to be Greenleaf himself. And the kind of uh, low level respect and authority he gains from being believed to be the son of a millionaire. But that applies to the people in the hotel or the people in a social circle. It doesn't matter when it comes to the police, for example. 
So in that regard, we don't find Tom Ripley to be very Machiavellian. We would expect a Machiavellian character to be, whenever necessary, manipulative and always in control. The way Matt Damon plays the character, the character of Tom Ripley appears to be passive or passive aggressive, servile when he's around, especially Greenleaf and Gregarious, right? He's not pretending to be powerless and then influencing and manipulating Dick Greenleaf. No, it's very much following him. In fact, when after the segment we watched uh, a week ago, they go to Rome and uh, Greenleaf finds in Rome his old friend Freddy, he turns around, they're in this store selling music, and of course we know that Greenleaf is uh, very passionate about jazz, and he tells Tom, yeah, make yourself scarce, go around, see Rome, and, and leave us alone. He, he'd rather spend time with Freddy than with Tom, and, and Tom is hurt. And, and Tom's reaction is not trying to manipulate the situation and uh, get back in control, but he will take his revenge later on. So from these traits, we don't see someone who's much in control. In a way, we can truly say he is Machiavellian, but only on the psychological side. Uh, you're familiar, we mentioned the Dark Triad, uh, which is a series of sociopathic qualities identified by, by psychologists for criminals and sociopaths in general, the Dark Triad being narcissism, sociopathy, uh, and Machiavellianism. And Machiavellianism in that context is associated primarily with lack of empathy the ability to commit a crime or do something immoral or even illegal without remorse, uh, without feeling the, uh, a great deal of psychological impact or repercussions from that behavior. And that is certainly true of Tom Ripley, that he goes on with his life even after he kills uh, Dickie or Freddy. Finally, there is an interplay between the operations of the characters and a variety of opportunities. An opportunity is something that Machiavelli discusses and we found references, for example, in chapter 6 uh, that we read and analyzed recently. However, in Machiavelli's view, opportunity is what allows the skills the training, the planning of the leader to excel. In the case of Tom Ripley, opportunity is exactly one of the shortcomings of his character's social play. That is to say, most of the criminal activities, the criminal practices, criminal operations of Tom Ripley are crimes of opportunity. And those are not Machiavellian at all by definition. That is to say, if you walk by an empty classroom and you see that the professor has left the classroom, there are no students, and the, I, the, the iPad Pro of the professor is on the table, and you watch around and you take the iPad Pro, you put it in your bag and you leave, you've committed a crime of opportunity, right? You're not a thief, but you've seen an opportunity. You've seen that, uh, there was complete control of the situation, at least apparently, right? And you just walk away with an iPad that is worth more than $1,000. Is that a Machiavellian act? No, because you've, you've seen, you've identified the possibility for momentary control, temporary control of the situation, but you have no control whatsoever of the larger context and the very fact that you stole that iPad now provokes a loss of control in the larger situation. That is to say, yes, you've gained this device worth $1,000, but you now might be find out maybe there was a camera. And the camera, since this is an Ecos 360 class, 
starts shooting at 9 instead of 9.15. And now the professor can uh, uh, take a shot of your face, uh, the way you address your, your bag, and, and then the police on campus will find you and you'll be uh, uh, tried by the Academic Judiciary Committee and you'll be expelled for uh, an extraordinary act of dishonesty, right? And you have no recourse against the powers, the players in the larger context. In fact, you're weaker in that context because of the crime. That's how a crime of opportunity is never a Machiavellian act because it's the result of an impulse is not combined with proper planning and it is not repeatable, meaning long term you don't gain any kind of power. You lose power, in fact, as a result. You've gained power for a, a very limited time within a very limited context, but in the larger context, you are now weaker compared to anyone else on the campus because you have this that might um, have its consequences, this act you committed, and you might have to pay the consequences, okay? That was the extent of my introduction, just to summarize the plot. The talented Miss Ripley is the story of a two-bit hustler who, at the beginning of the film, is found in New York playing the piano with a jacket with the Princeton emblem on uh, the left side. He is approached by a wealthy businessman, Mr. Greenleaf and his wife, who has a son, Dickie, who went to Princeton and is now in Italy, refusing his responsibility, refusing to uh, work in his father's business and preparing for a proper transition from his father's leadership in this business to his own. So Mr. Greenleaf suggests that Tom would go to Italy with all expenses paid on first class cruise to uh, Italy and uh, convince his old pal uh, Dickie to uh, go back to his family, in exchange for that, he would get a prize of a thousand dollars. So there is minimal preparation by Tom, uh, who is informed by Dickie's father that Dickie is really into jazz, and the only thing that Dickie does is to uh, study uh, jazz, to learn about uh, the, the best, most famous. Uh, jazz musicians, listen to uh, jazz music, train himself to recognize famous jazz pieces, and some Italian, if you want to call that uh, preparation. But once he goes there and uh, manages to connect with uh, Greenleaf, with Dickie, Tom changes his plan, right? He has no plan, really, about how to go convincing Tom, uh, convincing Dickie to go back to his family. And when he finds resistance, right, once again, he uh, has a passive reaction. He sees right away that Dickie has no intention of going back and switches his game from trying to get the thousand dollars of the reward for bringing Dickie home to living a good life with expenses paid by Dickie's father and by Dickie himself and having a good time in Italy. So already his plan has switched. They spend a little bit of time together in this fictional town of Mongibello, south of Naples. They go to Naples to a jazz club uh, where they uh, sing with a, a, a local uh, amateur singer musician. And uh, and in fact, it's interesting that they sing a song which is about pretending to be someone. Tu vuoi fare americano, you want to be American, is a famous Italian song from the 1950s about uh, the Italian young people from the period who want to pass as American, 
who uh, cherish American music, who uh, dress in an American way, who drink whiskey and soda, uh, etc., which is the kind of pretend game that Tom will play a lot in the music, in, in, the, in the film. So they spend time together. There is March there also, the girlfriend of Dickie. But as I said, after they decide to go to Rome, because Tom has never seen Rome and Dickie finds some amusement and some pleasure in the fresh perspective, the fresh experiences of Tom, for whom everything in Italy is, is new. After, in Rome, Dicky reconnects with, with his old pal, um, Freddy, things start to cool down. They go for a last trip together to Sanremo because Dicky wants to go to another place and he has to find a place where he can reserve a spot for his sailboat. So he's planning to sail from Mongibello to Sanremo, which is in northern Italy, closer to the Côte d'Azur, to the French southern coast. And uh, they go there to, to have a good time and this is where we will find them. And I must say the first scene, one of the first scenes we'll watch when they go out at sea is rather uh, graphic, <laughs> is, is the brutal killing by Tom of uh, uh, Dickie, after which Dickie will impersonate Tom, uh, well, after which Tom will impersonate Dickie uh, and try to manipulate people around him because he has to keep this game going where he pretends that Tom and Dickie are traveling through Italy, staying at different hotels, pretending that Dickie is alive, even though uh, Dickie has left, has separated from Marge, his girlfriend, and no one among his friends has seen him, but they all believe his family, his friends who are in Italy, they all believe that Dicky is still alive. Of course, at the end of this uh, uh, series of scenes, Freddy, who never really trusted Tom, maybe because Freddy himself is a conniving, duplicitous kind of friend to Dicky, Freddy finds out and Tom will have to react and kill Freddy himself, then go to Venice, etc. Nigel, you have a question. Why did he kill Dickie in the first place? Wouldn't it be beneficial to him? Well, it's a reaction to a discussion they have and the humiliation that Tom feels. It's also the only way he can recover control of this situation because Tom doesn't want to give up on the good life that he was having with Dickie. Of course, there is also a homosexual theme in the film where there is homosexual attraction that seems to also play a part in this. And of course, we must say that the character of Tom is represented more as a homosexual in the film and in the book itself is rather fluid instead. Is it, is it just one way with Tom or is it um, Dickie also? That's no, Dickie uh, treats Tom as a toy. It's a new toy. He has some fun with it. He will t say, Marge, he makes me laugh, mm -hmm. right? And, and he feels alive. Dickie is bored. But around Tom, when Tom has this big-eyed view of things in Italy and, and these big reactions, then Dicky uh, uh, draws uh, vitality out of that. But once he's completely bored, he discards him. He gets away and even, sell, even tells uh, Tom, you, you were never in Princeton, right? Meaning, I knew that, I knew you were playing, but I wanted to play with you uh, as well. So it's very much a passive-aggressive reaction by Tom that leads to this homicide and nothing that is really planned. Okay, let's go because otherwise we won't be able to see enough of the film. Oh, 
and I'll stop because it's time. And if you have any questions or comments, we can talk about the film on Monday. So have a nice weekend. Uh, please return the attendance to the table, whoever has it. Okay, thank you.